This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. We discuss stem cell treatments with researcher and orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Adam Anz, on this edition of Conversations. Dr. Adam Anz is an orthopedic surgeon and researcher at the Andrews Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Dr. Anz received his undergraduate degree from Vanderbilt University. He attended medical school at the University of South Alabama College of Medicine and did his residency at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Dr. Anz has completed fellowships at the renowned Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado and the Kuala Lumpur Sports Medical Center in Malaysia. Dr. Anz specializes in sports medicine, orthopedic surgery and stem cell research. Currently, his research is focused on cartilage regeneration and MRI T2 mapping. We're pleased to have Dr. Adam Anz on this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. S to begin with, what is a stem cell? So a stem cell is a cell that is one generation matured from some of the most immature cells in our bodies and not just in humans, but in animals of all types. And stem cells have mainly four capabilities that make them unique and make them really exciting to us as physicians. And those four things is they have the ability to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So one stem cell can, can make two stem cells. They also have the ability to differentiate. And all that means is this stem cell can become a cartilage cell. The stem cell can become a bone cell. It can become a fat cell. It can become a different type of cell. They also have the ability to move so they can latch onto blood vessels and sort of use the blood vessels to move a little bit. In that case, they're, they're called a pericyte, which is just a different name. Mm -hmm. And they also have the ability to release growth factors, other sort of messaging, signaling molecules that tell other cells what to do. So that's, when we say stem cell, that's what we're talking about. And, and that's why it's, it's fascinating as physicians uh, and also researchers, because these are the properties that we really need when we're thinking about how to repair tissues or, or kind of heal different injuries. And so that's, that's in a nutshell what a stem cell is, uh, you know, and it's, it's why they're exciting and why they've gained so much interest from a medical standpoint. Now, as I understand it, there are a couple of different types of stem cells, I guess, embryonic and then is it adult stem cells? Correct. You know, when we say, you know, stem cells, uh, to a certain extent, it's had it's kind of had a bad press and, and mm -hmm. or a bad feel to it. And that's because when we first started studying stem cells, we were studying embryonal stem cells. And, and when I say we, it wasn't, you know, I wasn't involved in embryo. Right, I've right. never been involved in embryonal stem cells. I've always been involved with adult stem cell research. And, and what that means is uh, when within our body, there are stem cells and different tissues. So, for instance, within our fat, there are stem cells that live on the side of blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So within fat, there are stem cells. So when people are talking about stem cells from fat, they're talking about adipose-derived stem cells. They're just stem cells that happen to be in the fat tissue. When we say stem cells in our bone marrow, you'll hear us say bone marrow-derived stem cells. So we're talking about those same cells. So stem cells just is identifying a cell with sort of those four capabilities. And the adult stem cells mean that they're, they're within our body and we can use them or we can, we're investigating the use of them for, for different medical purposes. If you think about a bone marrow transplant, right. when someone has a bone marrow transplant, what physicians do is they take bone marrow from their pelvis, they store it, and then they give it back to them or to a, to a recipient. And so that's giving them stem cells from the bone marrow. So the, the hematology oncology or, the, or cancer doctors have been doing this for, for many, many years. And so we've been using stem cells within medicine for a, a long time. It's just the actual way that we've said it hasn't been the same as we're saying it now. Now explain an embryonic stem so cell. So an embryonic stem cell is a stem cell from an embryo. And so, you know, earlier and about 20 years ago, researchers <clears throat> were using cells from, from related to abortions and using those cells to, to look at what we can do with a stem cell. And there was funding issues regarding the federal government and, and sort of everything that we developed then, we know now we don't necessarily need those stem cells anymore. So in other words, 
an embryonal stem cell, when we're, we're thinking about what we're doing with cells, mm -hmm. it's sort of like talking about a VHS tape. <laughs> you know, okay. we're not really interested in embryonal stem cells anymore. Okay. Um, because it's, we don't, we're interested in where we can get the stem cells from. And so if we don't need to get them from an embryo, if we can get cells that have just much, as much potential from your own body, right. we're much more interested in those. And so the, the controversy was primarily around embryonic. It was primar primar primarily about where we were getting the stem cells from. Okay. And so you know, when the first days of stem cell research, where we were getting the stem cells from was what made it controversial. Okay. Now that we can get them from our own body, it, it's, it's not controversial. And cancer doctors for years have been taking blood from our bloodstream um, getting cells out of the blood after giving you a little bit of hormone called neupogen and storing those, those cells. Those are, are stem cells. So we've been using it medically. It's just now all different angles of medicine are investigating stem cells. Where so it's is become this? a hot topic. Uh, wh where is this going? How, how fast is this moving and where does it end up? Well, it was, it was moving quickly um, until sort of the past five years or so. The, the FDA has appropriately stepped in to regulate stem cell therapy. If, and I think they've done a good thing here, and here's why. Um, the FDA is, is thinking about patient safety, mm -hmm. and they sort of tier different therapies into high-risk or low-risk therapies. And based upon how they've determined that is what they determine needs to be done before you can provide this to a patient, if that makes sense. So the FDA has decided that essentially all stem cell therapies are similar to drug therapies. They are high risk therapies. So they need to go through the same pathway that a drug needs to go through to provide it to patients. Okay. And so where is it going? It's slowed down a little bit in the past few years is because the FDA has kind of been feeling itself along and then made, made a, about three or four key rulings now where they've said, you know what, this is like a drug. We have to go through the drug pathway before we can let, before we can let you give it to patients. Now, with that being said, I, I truly wholeheartedly believe this is the next 20 years of medicine. You know, where in the past, for, for specifically sports medicine, we've right. been developing uh, the use of the arthroscope or, or the, the scope for the past 30 years, and that revolutionized what we did. This is going to revolutionize what we do for the next 30 years. Wow. What are you doing from a research standpoint at the Andrews Institute? Tell me about what you have going on there. So right now, we're, we're gearing up for a couple different clinical trials. Um, in addition to stem cells, there's other therapies that we're, we're learning more about and we're using as much as we can to help patients with something, say for instance, knee pain. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have knee pain and you have early mechanical changes, we're looking at ways that we can use your body's own healing abilities and, and sort of put them in the right place at the right time, so to speak. So one thing that we're specifically doing for many years now, especially in Europe, patients have, or, or doctors have been using platelet-rich plasma. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is we take your blood we use a centrifuge to separate out the red blood cells, the plasma, and the platelets. And we take the platelets, and then we use them in different instances. So platelets have growth factors in it. They have some of those signaling mechanisms uh, that help us when we're healing. And so we've been using platelet-rich plasma for a while now. Now, the, the exact evidence about how we can use it and how we should use it is not that great yet. And so one thing we're doing right now is we're putting together a trial where we're gonna compare using platelet-rich plasma for, for knee pain and early wear and tear changes versus bone marrow aspirate and taking people's cells from their bone marrow and putting it into their knee and sort of compare and contrast and say, well, which one does better? Do they both do well? Mm -hmm. And sort of hash that out. So that's one immediate study that we're, we're putting together. Uh, but they we're also gearing up to do a study involving stem cells from the patient's own blood to help with, with cartilage procedures and how we're trying to make new cartilage in the knee when cartilage has either been injured or when cartilage has worn down. Okay, and now are, are you have a, a lab dedicated to that at, at Andrews, is that? Not yet, uh, okay. we don't. Um, so at the Andrews Institute, we have the Andrews Research and Education Institute, which mm -hmm. is a, 
a facility that helps us when we're doing clinical trials. It also helps us when we're training physicians on different techniques. It also helps us as we train our fellows, mm -hmm. which are people who finish residency or are doing additional training. So that entity is, is sort of our first step that we've used for a long time to help us educate and, and do clinical trials mm -hmm. and other research. Now, what we're going to do is build a, a regenerative medicine lab laboratory or a regenerative medicine lab. And the reason is, in order to do stem cell research, you have to have the ability to harvest, process, and store the stem cells. So, for example, the, the research that I've been most involved with is, is looking at peripheral blood stem cells harvested, stored, and then given at different time points after a, a knee surgery. Mm -hmm. And a, a gentleman in Malaysia who's become a mentor of mine has been doing this since 2007. And he has, in, in my opinion, the most promising method for cartilage repair that I've seen regarding what's, what's coming in the future with, with gar, regarding the technology. And so we, we are looking to set up a clinical trial here in the United States with that technology. To do that, we have to have a lab where we can do all those all those things, harvest, process, and store, so that we can do the clinical trial. So this two weeks ago, the city of Gulf Breeze gave us a grant. Uh, they've agreed in concept to give us $350,000 to build the infrastructure. Oh. Um, and then after that, we've built the infrastructure, we have to do a little bit of homework just in terms of the actual processes and making sure everything's up to speed. And then we will be able to house the clinical trial uh, from the technology out of Malaysia. So you'll have basically an, an international brain trust coming together in a way. You know, that's, it's uh, what we really hope to do is just take the bull by the horns and be pioneers in biologics. Mm -hmm. And when I say biologics, it, we're talking about, you know, stem cell treatments, platelet-rich plasma treatments, bone marrow-derived treatments, all these different types of technologies that is, in my opinion, the future of medicine. Give them a platform for the different entities from all over the world to come do their studies with us here mm -hmm. and then also help disseminate that to not only the United States but the world. And so it's it's really about just creating the platform, oh, you know, yeah. the platform so that we can do the studies so that the patients can be treated but then also so that we can help people and physicians develop this technology and develop the future of medicine. Take me back because you you were uh, did a fellowship in, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. How did that come about, and, and, and what did you learn there? What, yeah. I, I'm assuming that's what inspired you in this direction. It really is. You know, in 2009, I was a resident at Wake Forest in orthopedic surgery. And within your training, you're, you're learning from mentors, mm -hmm. and you're kind of watching what they do in different scenarios. And whenever I was in a case where there was an area of cartilage injury, you really sort of watch orthopedic surgeons, and, and me currently, I, I'm not pointing fingers, we dance around the cartilage injury. Because right now we don't have a great solution. You know, if you have an area where you've dinged off a big part of cartilage, there's not a 100% fantastic solution for it. So every time you watch physicians, they're playing not to lose. You know, it, with, with how to treat the cartilage, we're kind of, we're not playing to win, right. we're playing not to lose. Right. Yeah, that area of cartilage, it isn't perfect, but I don't want to look, I don't want to touch it because <laughs> I don't want to make it any worse. It's as good as we can do right now. Okay. And so in 2009, we had a visitor from Malaysia and his name's uh, Kayong Saw, and he is an orthopedic surgeon. He trained at Cambridge in the UK and he's been practicing in Malaysia for a long time. And, and Malaysia is, is a lot like, or Kuala Lumpur is a lot like Manhattan. Um, it's, it's, when I first went there in 2009, I didn't know where I was going. I was like, what, what's Malaysia going to be like? <laughs> but surprisingly, it's just like being in the United States. You know, it's, everyone there speaks English for the most part. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's a, great, a great city and a great country. But when I was there in 2009, I was watching Dr. Saul with his treatment of cartilage, and he was playing to win, plain and simple. He saw an area where the cartilage wasn't perfect. He said, don't worry about that. He kind of takes that bad cartilage off. He does an arthro, uh, arthroscopic procedure similar to what we do here for cartilage regeneration called microfracture, which is where you have a cartilage defect. You make a conduit from the bone marrow to the cartilage defect. Blood and mesenchymal stem cells come from the bone marrow and create some sort of repair, but it's not, it's good, but it's not 100% perfect. So he was, he's, I saw him do that and then add peripheral blood stem cells at different time points. So he does the surgery, 
and he comes back and gives different injections of stem cells. And so he's been doing stem cell therapy as a way to augment orthopedic surgery since 2007. And it's spilled over into his entire practice. You know, so it's not just how he treats cartilage, but it's how he treats non-healing bones. It's, he uses it to help him when he's got someone with an with a MCL sprain in their knee. So it, it's really spilled in to, to multiple avenues of not only his practice, but his partner's practice. And so that, that inspired me because I was seeing someone who was approaching cartilage in a whole different light. You know, he was playing to win. And so that got me really excited about it. And I, I came back and, and when I was over there, I said, hey, you know, how can I help? You know, and so we, we put together a case series, which is just where you collect a number of patients that he's done. And then you, you put together an article and then you, you ask a journal if they'll publish it. And so we had an article published uh, just on a case series. And at that time, he was doing a trial where he was randomizing people to either the treatment without stem cells or the treatment with stem cells. And so I kind of helped him collect all that data and then put together another article that we published uh, just this past year. So in 2009, kind of began my journey, okay. my stem cell journey. And tell you the truth, it's really kind of changed what I want to be when I grow up, so to speak. Because you know? <laughs> I used to think I didn't, never didn't want to do research. I didn't want to I didn't want to do anything other than practice orthopedic surgery, but now I've found that I'm really fascinated by it. I really, I love working on this project because it's, it's the future, and it, it really is a game changer regarding orthopedics and, and sports medicine. You're a young guy. As you look out, it must be absolutely, well, number one, exciting, but amazing where this is going to go for you. I mean... When you dream, I mean, when you see yeah. your best case scenario, what do you see? <laughs> it's a game changer. Uh, it really, it really is. Having the ability to augment what we do, it's it's going to pervade everything, you know. I, and I mean, it, I, you may have heard this quote before. I don't know if if uh, Dr. Andrew said it when you were on his show, but this is what got me here to work with him was that he was sitting there and we were in between one of his surgeries, and he said, "Adam, you know, the first." great revolution in sports medicine was the arthroscope, which is what lets us look inside joints and, and treat things without having to make a big incision and open them up. So he said the first great invention was, first great revolution is, is that. The second's going to be this. And so that sort of, that inspires me. You know, what I've seen regarding, you know, the data or the actual evidence that my mentor in Malaysia has captured, Dr. Shaw, it's, it's what inspires me. But also the ability to to take a problem that right now we don't have a great solution to and to provide a better solution is what excites me as well. Let's talk about it from a standpoint of something probably most people can relate to. Mm -hmm. A lot of National Football League fans around and so we see, you know, see what happened to, to Marcus Lattimore when he was at University of South Carolina now with the San Francisco 49ers. We see RG3, Robert Griffin the third with the Washington Redskins. Uh, prior to that, Adrian Peterson. And these guys seem to be coming back uh, much quicker than, than the same scenario had it occurred years ago. Uh, tell me more. Uh, so at this point, you know, when we see athletes come back quickly, um, you know, these, these athletes are extremely motivated. You know, they are, they have, you know, amazing, amazing bodies. You know, they are, they are motivated. They are driven. You know, at, at this point, we're not, we're not to the point where we're going to really use tomorrow's technology to, to help in these cases today. Okay. You know, I, I think, you know, especially Adrian Peterson, he's just an amazing athlete. Right. You know, he's, he's sort of a, a stellar guy. And so, you know, where we are today, you know, we're, we're using this, we're using what we can do now, what the FDA will allow us to do safely now. Um, but we're, we're not, we're not really using it as much as I hope to be using it in 10 years. But in 10 years, if that same situation occurs, how quick does that recovery happen? That, that's a theory. I mean, that, that, and it's, uh, I 100% agree and echo your excitement. I mean, that, we know right now that someone who has an ACL tear, we know that that graft matures between 3 to 12 months. And so, for instance, I've got a, let's take a, a great example. I've got a young high school kid who, he's a senior at, at a high school. He tore his ACL when we fixed it in July, and he wants to play in the playoffs. And, and I'm sitting there <laughs> like, wait a minute, you know. And so now he's he's, he's a great example. He is he's two months out, 
and his muscles look fantastic. You know, his quad strength is great. You know, he's been working hard. He's gotten his muscle strength back. Um, and so I know that from a muscle standpoint, he's ready. But I also know from a, from a bio, from a, not a biomechanical, but from a cellular level, uh, his graft isn't ready. Okay, Does that make sense? Yep. And that's the exciting thing. That's why I'm pursuing uh, MRI research. Is, but what I really want to do is use MRI to, to gauge our maturation of, of our cartilage and our ACL grafts. And so then let's, let's try some of your own stem cells and see if we can get that graft to mature quicker. Interesting. And I think we will. I think we'll be able to make grafts mature quicker. Um, yeah, and, and it's going to take some time, but I think that's where we'll be in 10 years. That's, that's fascinating. For the, for the ordinary person, ordinary adult, what's the biggest challenge that they face as they age from an orthopedic standpoint? Um, we all face the challenge of our cartilage. Um, you know, the natural history of, of a knee or a hip uh, or joints is that the cartilage, as it undergoes stress and strain throughout the course of our life, uh, it starts to take its toll. You know, the amount of times that you go up and down stairs takes toll on the cartilage underneath your kneecap. Um, the amount of times that you play tennis takes its toll on your shoulder. And so that's, as, as all, all human beings, that's something we deal with. Um, being able to, to help that and sort of slow that process is, is another thing that really inspires me. And I, I do think that uh, we, are, we right now are, are using different injections into, say, a knee, for example, to try and, and stave off the body's response to that mechanical wear. Because there's two things that happen in a knee related to knee pain. There's the mechanical wear of the cartilage, but then there's also the body's response to it. And so the body's response to it is what actually causes then it to break down more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you have a little cartilage cell that's been being pressed its entire life and it started to, to wear a little bit, it stops becoming a cartilage cell and it starts releasing all these inflammatory mediators that cause pain and swelling and Inflammation is a word you'll hear physicians yeah. say a lot. It just means those things. So that's something that we all deal with. If we can find a way, and, and one thing that we're working on is different injectables to, to tell that cartilage cell to go back to work. You know, oh, yeah. Stop being in a cell that's releasing inflammatory mediators and, and try and get those cells to, to start, start being cartilage cells again. Is, is there, are there any prevention methods that we can do to hopefully stave that sort of wear and tear off? Um, you know, an old adage that's, uh, you know, motion is lotion actually has some truth to it. Um, motion and, and is one thing that stimulates our cartilage and our knee to maintain its normal cartilage and normal functional status, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you an example. If you break a bone, what happens is blood comes to that site and that blood turns into a clot that turns into cartilage first and then turns into bone. If you hold that bone real still, it turns into bone. If you start moving this bone, it basically forms a joint there. And so your body has these normal signaling mechanisms. And motion is one thing that signals a joint to, to maintain its normal joint health, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So motion is one thing that we all can, can stay active with. So I, I typically say, you know, staying active. That's how you, you do one thing that's good for you. You know, staying strong in the muscles around a joint because not only do ligaments and things like meniscus help stabilize, say, our knee, but also the muscles around our knee, our calf muscles, our hamstring muscles, our quad muscles, those all provide stability to our joint. So two things right away, stay active, stay moving, stay strong, keep the muscles around your knee strong. And then in terms of a, a healthy lifestyle and healthy eating, a lot of times you do get a lot of the vitamin supplements within your normal diet that help sort of stave off inflammation, you know, mm -hmm. keep your immune system where it needs to be because your immune system is, is what reacts a little bit to mechanical wear and tear. So if your immune system is a little bit hyperreactive, then you're going to have a little bit more inflammation um, is, is one, one idea. So yeah. things like vitamin D, staying with a normal healthy diet, they have effects on your joints. I've got just a couple of minutes left. Give me just a, a couple of pointers that uh, parents should be aware of for youth playing sports. How, how, best, protect, how best to protect yourself? Give them an off season. <laughs> that makes you know, sense. Really give them an off season. If you think about professional athletes, if you think about college athletes, 
they all have an off season. And, um, you know, every day in clinic, you know, we'll have patients who ask them when was the last time they didn't play baseball. And they kind of look up at the sky and they're like, uh, you know, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> when was the last time you didn't play soccer? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> you yeah. know, and so the, the point is, you know, g- give your children an off season. I mean, their, their bodies really need it. Um, we do see, you know, stress fractures. Uh, we, we, we do see the wear and tear of, of chronic activity, chronic professional, professional-like sport. You know, it takes its toll on our bodies. So everybody needs an off season. Um, and so that's, that's one, one thing right away. And then with that off season idea, also, you know, let your kids cross train, so to speak. You know, if they get too focused into, you know, one repetitive activity over and over and over and over and over and over again, you know, they, they might not have as much normal balance regarding their bodies too. You know, we, so in other words, if, if baseball is their thing, don't just 100% all that. Maybe have them play basketball or yeah. soccer or track or whatever. Let them what branch out. You know, let, them, let them be a kid. You know, they're going to be good. You know, yeah. I mean, the athletes are athletes. You know, they, they're going to shine no matter what. They're going to be great. And yeah. so give them some time to have an off season. Give them some time to, to relax and be kids and pursue other activities. You know, and, and the, the great athletes are, are great athletes. You know, they're, they're going to shine out and they're going to work hard and succeed. Fascinating, fascinating. I, I'm just curious in about one minute, what, obviously the stem cell we, we were talking about, well, what just, and, and as I said before, you're such a young guy, so I mean, you got a huge future ahead of you here. I mean, what are you just most fired up about? And, and let me let me broaden it past orthopedics, yeah. just medicine in general. Uh, I think I'm, I'm most passionate about just pushing forward the technology, pushing forward what we do today. You know, I'd I always remember sort of sitting in the office with, with someone who'd had a cartilage procedure and, you know, it had failed. It just, they still weren't doing well. Uh, and th- th- that can't be it. You know, there's got to be more. There's yeah. got to be more out there. There's got to be a better way to do what we do. There's got to be a way to make what we do better. Yeah. And, and that's sort of, you know, I think that's when you, that's, I think, why I love not only, you know, stem cell research and orthopedics, but then also athletics, you know, because if you look at, you know, the great athletes, you know, they're always looking to make themselves better. Yeah. You know, and that, that I think that's what, what, why I'm so passionate about taking care of the athletes because they're always trying to get better. And it's the same with medicine. We're always trying to make it better. Fabulous. Enjoy the conversation. Same here. I hope you'll keep us up to date on all your research. I will do. Absolutely. Dr. Adam Ans, he is a researcher and also a uh, surgeon at the Andrews Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine in Gulf Breeze, Florida. We certainly hope you'll watch some more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for spending some time with us. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.